So these kinds of problems, this is a very, very simplified version of what are called in the statistics literature as bandit problems. <coughs> right, so you know why they are called bandit problems? You know this, Deepak. No? Oh, come on. You have not enough of lab meetings to know these things. <coughs> anyway, so people know what a one-arm bandit is. Anyway, so one arm bandit is a slot machine. You know what slot machines are? You put a coin there, then you pull a lever, right? And then what it does? It steals your money, basically. Right? <laughs> I mean, all of that is mumbo jumbo. You know, of course, all of you must realize that no casino is going to put up a machine that actually makes money for the customer, right? So in the long run, the slot machine will steal your money, right? And then you just keep pulling that thing. So that lever that you pull is called the arm right and since it has one lever it's called the one arm bandit because it steals your money right so it's a one arm bandit so here this is very similar to the slot machine except that instead of having one arm it has n arms right so each time you pull an arm you get some kind of a payoff right and if you want to really complete the bandit analogy so every time you need to pull an arm you have to pay one rupee Right? Sometimes you get back one rupee, sometimes you get back nothing. Right? So that way you know that you're certainly stealing your money, right? So something like that. Right? So, but that's essentially why it is called the bandit problem. Uh, sometimes it, uh, it's also called the multi-arm bandits, right? So it's called multi-arm bandits because, well, it has multiple arms, right? And uh, the dynamics is very similar to a slot machine. Now we know why I kept calling actions as arms, right? So because uh, the, the the literature typically talks about arms on a bandit, right? But it's it's really for us we don't have to worry about the bandit uh, connections. So then it's, it's essentially just actions, right? Good. Any questions so far? There are many many ways in which you can solve this uh, multi-arm bandit problems, right? But uh, the crux here is always that you have to be balancing the exploration versus exploitation right so i'll talk about multiple uh, um, solution concepts right what do we mean when we say i want to solve a multi arm bandit problem right so one solution concept right is asymptotic correctness. So what do I mean by that? I don't put any bounds on you or anything, right? Here is this multi-arm bandit problem. So give me a guarantee that eventually you will be selecting the arm which has the highest payoff, right? As t tends to infinity, you will be selecting the arm that has the highest payoff, right? So that is called asymptotic correctness, right? So this is one way of solving it. A lot of the older literature <coughs> on bandit problems essentially concern themselves with asymptotic correctness and then of course they had some results on uh, things like rates of convergence and so on and so forth how quickly you reach the uh, the guarantee and so on and so forth but uh, by and large the analysis was on asymptotic correctness you come up with very simple algorithms and then you show that uh, the uh, asymptotically they will converge to the right right so this is the one kind of thing right the second uh, uh, popular uh, solution concept is essentially known as regret optimality. Suppose I knew, right? suppose I knew from time 0 which is the best arm. Right? Suppose I knew from the beginning what is the best arm to pull. Right? And I keep pulling the arm over and over and over again, right? And I keep repeating this experiment multiple times. What will be my expected payoff 
So this is time. The expected payoff, it's going to be some kind of a flat line, right? So that's possibly the best expected payoff that I can achieve. Right? Because I know from the beginning, I know what is the right arm. Right? But since I don't know this, I have to do this exploration right, to figure out which is the right arm. Right? So my payoff will look something like this. Right? Over time, it will eventually reach that. Right? As time becomes, I mean, t, t goes to infinity, I will eventually reach that point. Right? So now, this reward that you see here, right? this is what I could have got if I had known the right answer from the beginning. Right? So this is in some sense a loss that I incurred because of my learning process. Right? So this is sometimes colorfully referred to as regret. So it's like, oh, alas, if I had known this from the beginning, you know, I could have done so much better. So this is regret. So another way of thinking about regret is that I'm trying to maximize the total reward that I obtain. Okay, not just the asymptotically the payoff, right? Even during the learning, I need to get as much payoff as possible. Right? So ideally, I would want this slope to be pretty steep. Right? If the slope is very steep, so what will happen is this 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 area will come down, right? If the slope is very steep, this area is going to come down. But what is the trade-off? Typically, you will have to give up is it will take a longer time to reach optimality. Usually, there's a trade-off, right? Because you have typically to do this, right? You will be giving up some amount of exploration, right? So there are some corner cases where you might actually miss out on important exploration because you are trying to be very optimistic with respect to this regret thing, right? So I wanted to be, I wanted to have very very little regret. So what my, what I might end up doing is, I might miss out on certain key exploration that I should have done. So essentially, what will happen is, so in some cases, I will never reach optimality also because I would have ignored certain uh, important outcomes along the way. So this is the trade-off that you have to worry about. But regret optimality is essentially looking at how steeply you learn at the outset. Okay? Of course, that does not mean I can be really bad, right? I mean, does it have a small regret? Right? But I did learn very fast. I actually went up the y axis. Right? But then I am going to <laughs> incur a constant, very, very large constant regret. Okay? So that is not a, that is not, so you have to balance it, right? So, because you keep accumulating, even though this has reached here, but you still keep accumulating regret, right? So it is not at uh, come to the optimal case. In fact, we know that no algorithm can guarantee that your regret will grow small. I mean, essentially, regret will fall right faster than log t. So it has to grow at least as log t, right? Suppose you have taken t time steps, the regret you have accumulated till that point will be proportional to log t. Right? So, and as t becomes larger, the rate of growth will become smaller and smaller. Right? But that is the best rate of growth that you can achieve. All that you can fiddle play around with this, some a times log t will be the rate. Right? So, that a is what you can fiddle around with. So, those constants you can fiddle around with, but log t itself is non-negotiable. So, there are results that show that log t is a lower bound. So, you cannot do better than log t in achieving regret. Right? So essentially, so if you think of this area above this curve and between this dotted line and this curve, so that area will keep growing at some rate, right? As t becomes larger and larger, that area keeps growing at some rate. So the rate at which it will grow will be at least log t. So that is the result that we have. So I am not going to show you that result, but I will we'll talk about a couple of other, uh, other things. Okay. So is it clear? So people understand what regret is, right? So third thing that I want to talk about is uh, what is called <coughs> P 
pack optimality, right? Or not, it's not, I shouldn't really call it pack optimality, but it should be more uh, pack complexity, right? So here's a little tricky thing. So PAC stands for probably, approximately, correct. Okay. Sometimes in a very loose fashion, we tend to use these as interchangeable things. Yeah, he's probably right, okay, and he's approximately right. Right? So, but they are not interchangeable, they are in very different contexts, very, very different things. When they say somebody is probably right, that means he is either right or wrong. Okay? So, he is right with some probability and he is wrong with some probability. Right? When they say somebody is approximately right, he is almost surely not right, right? but he is very close to being right. right. This is essentially what approximately means. So, it turns out that both of these concepts are applicable in a bandit setting. <coughs> so when I say somebody is approximately right in the bandit setting, what do I mean? That I give you an arm, right? Finally, you know what is the goal? At the end of the day, I'm supposed to give you an arm back, right? I'm, this is, and this is supposed to have the highest expected payoff. When I say I'm approximately right, so that means that the arm I'm going to return to you will be very close in payoff to the best possible arm. Right? Suppose I return some A to you, so Q star of A will be very close to say Q star of A star, which is the best arm. Right? Does it make sense? So I will return some arm A to you at the end of my algorithm. Q star of A will be very, very close to Q star of A star. Right? What is Q star again? The true expected payoff, which I do not know about. Right? The algorithm does not know what Q star is. But it will return an arm and the guarantee I give you is the Q star of the term, the unknown Q star of the term will be close to the Q star of the best term. Okay? So, this is the approximately correct. Okay? So, what is the probably correct part here? No, 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 no. It is either approximately correct or not. Because we are already only giving you approximately correct guarantees, right? So, with a very high probability, it is approximately correct. Right? With some small probability, it might give you an arm that is more than some distance away from the best arm. Yeah, that is what PAC is. Probably approximately correct. Oh, I see, okay. Probably correct would mean, yeah, you are, yeah, is it optimal or not optimal? Yeah, probably approximately correct is, well, with some probability, you are approximately correct some probability you are not right so typically uh, there are many ways in which uh, people talk about this there's a one po one popular way of uh, specifying this is called the epsilon delta pack uh, where uh, epsilon uh, uh, refers to the the approximately part and the delta refers to the probability part right so with the probability of 1 minus delta okay the solution I return to you will be within epsilon of the best arm. Right? So, this essentially means probability that probability that Q star of A, that is arm I return to you, is greater than uh, that is one way of writing it, but that is not what the pack framework guarantees. So, what is the difference between the first one and this one? 
that is the first one is relative guarantee, this is an absolute guarantee. So, you yeah, could think of uh, either way, you can think of absolute guarantee or related, uh, as a uh, relative guarantee, but this is essentially what PAC, opti op PAC optimality means, right. So, for a given epsilon delta, if I can give that guarantee, right, then you say that is PAC optimal for this, but what is the interesting part here, right. If I allow you to draw an infinite number of samples from the arms, right. I can always guarantee this. A given, give me whatever epsilon delta I want. I can just keep drawing arms, okay. And then at some point, I can say, okay, now I have satisfied this. Okay, the optimality part comes in when you want to minimize the sample complexity, right? So, given an epsilon and a delta, what is the smallest number of times I have to select arms such that I can give you that epsilon delta pack guarantee? Okay, does it make sense? So, that is essentially what we are looking at here. So, this is a sample complexity question, right. This is a, the correctness question, right. This is a kind of a rate of convergence question and this is a sample complexity question. So, these are all slightly different notions of solutions. When I say you are solving a bandit problem, these are different notions of solutions and the kind of algorithms that you come up with for addressing each of these questions would be pretty different. You don't know, but I give you the guarantee. <laughs> this is the if, if you know Q star A star, <coughs> then this will be as close as that. So how, how will we know when when to stop? Uh, how will you know that will be within epsilon or what epsilon will be for like n number of trials? Exactly. So these are questions that we will look at as we go along. I have not told you what the I'm just telling you what the solution concepts are, right? I've not even told you how you actually solve these problems, right? So when we look at those. I will tell you how to go about doing this. In fact, it will turn out that the algorithms themselves are very simple, okay. But to analyze it, to show that this kind of guarantee holds is where all the trick lies. Okay. 